you would have read August's Fin Review, you've got, got the headline probably imprinted in your memory, the saddest profession of all was the headline. And it's about the fact that one in five practitioners are going to suffer a mental illness during, at some stage during their lifetime. That we see that, um, that anxiety and depression can contribute to the breakdown of a relationship with a client that leads to a complaint, that leads to an investigation. And we also, as regulator, must be very sensitive to the, the, the impact that, um, that, um, um, that anxiety and depression has on your performance. There is a, a, a your firm's probably publicised it, there's a wonderful organisation called the Tristan Jepson Foundation that, just, that involves interviews with partners and practitioners um, from firms largely in Sydney, but uh, uh, big firms, medium firms, little firms who have dealt with anxiety and depression amongst their staff, amongst themselves, amongst their partners, about how important it is to manage it, to a acknowledge it, um, and how successful you can be um, with managed depression, um, and, and uh, how, as a uh, regulator, we have to um, acknowledge the fact that many of the breakdowns of relationships between solicitor and client might have their origins in um, unmanaged um, medical conditions. We often found that we were having terrible arguments and disagreements with the practitioner during the investigation which in many cases was attributed um, to anxiety and depression, the same symptom that caused the breakdown of relationship that caused the complaint. Um, and from, from, a, from a board point of view, with my CEO of the board hat on, you know each, each uh, practitioner has to be a fit and proper person. They've got to be suitable to carry on a, on a, uh, to, to, to carry a practicing certificate. Um, Mental impairment might represent a condition that bears on a person's suitability to practice, but managed depression is not mental impairment. And from a regulator's point of view, we keep on having to pinch ourselves in our communications and our, and our publications and make sure we discuss depression and anxiety um, often and reassure practitioners that if you, if you reveal to your partner, your supervisor, your family, your doctor, uh, your colleagues uh, uh, an anxiety or depressive condition, that does not mean that you have declared to the world that you are suffering a mental impairment that, that threatens your licence to practice. It just doesn't. And until we as regulator communicate that to practitioners, many practitioners will be inhibited from disclosing what's an important medical condition in our industry. Um, so I'll finish with that lecture about mental health, etc., and invite um, anyone to comment or question, if you have any. Oh, yeah. Uh, I work in a CLC, and uh, our clients are primarily uh, people with uh, different types of disabilities, including uh, specific diagnosis of mental illness, history of uh, voluntary and involuntary treatment. Um, I'm quite comfortable with uh, what uh, can be done in relation to client disclosure about uh, committing a crime or uh, doing something like that. We, we had a dilemma in relation to clients disclosing self-harm and um, we thought that that was also protected by confidentiality, but we wanted to do um, to do something about it because we felt uncomfortable that clients would, would say that they would do it and they would do that, and it seems there was nothing they could do. So we, in good faith, we, um, we, we, we uh, found a clause to be inserted in our typical client agreement whereby we say that um, the following information would not be considered confidential. I suppose our objective there was to somehow get advanced consent from the client of the things that we would not consider confidential. And so, uh, commission of a crime uh, was there, and also uh, some harm. But um, in, in discussion with, with uh, uh, 
uh, lawyers in the sector, we were, we were told that that by itself is not acceptable. And, and we're back in the dilemma, and I was wondering whether we might have a view on that. <laughs> that's, a, um, yeah, that's a difficult situation. Um, I know that um, yeah, threats of self-harm is quite different to threats to commit you know, a, a crime against another person. I know that lawyers are quite free to contact the police and, and report instances where they think that uh, their client is going to you know, commit a crime or hurt a person or, or what have you. I know um, with our office as well, quite often we get threats uh, made against us and made against other people, like judges, for example, and we have you know, freely reported those threats to the police and, and they've handled that, but threats of self-harm. Especially when you're mm. the trusted advisor for yeah. the, to the person who... I think the legal advice is about right, which is... Uh, I don't think you can create a universal declaration to every client that, you, that they must gift to you authority to communicate uh, uh, certain aspects of their behaviour to others. I think you would have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. You are acting in the interests of your client. Um, and there will be situations where the interests of your client are served by you identifying that, uh, that suicide threat or that risk of self-harm to a person who can assist them. Um, th but um, I haven't really got a, m a more sophisticated answer than that. As, uh, what about anyone else, David? Uh, well, it's not a communication that's protected, as I see it, by legal professional privilege. It's not a communication for the purpose of seeking legal advice, and it's not a communication in anticipation of legal proceedings. So I don't see that outside that professional relationship that there is an obligation of confidentiality. But I'm happy to be persuaded otherwise. Well, trust an ex-holy relic partner to come up with to get the best answer. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not, it's not actually to do with legal advice. Um, you could make it clear to people that, you're, that the confidentiality will apply to the legal advice that you are asked to provide and that you do provide, but that other information that they might choose to convey to you is not protected by that. It probably is in relation to legal advice because um, the, I, I can see a situation where your discussion of the medical condition of the individual is relevant to the legal work you're doing for them in some cases. And therefore, or if, you, or if they say, if you don't get me the result I want, I'm going to kill myself. Yeah, well, that's. I wish you hadn't asked that question. I don't know if you answered that one. <laughs> Anything else? The back? Well, I'd be asked if the client is the murderer. And the client, they're threatening self harm, they're threatening to stab themselves or shoot themselves or whatever it is. And you get a clear review about how far along that process the client is. Is the client actively um, planning how they're going to go about? shooting themselves or harming themselves, and we say that I'd be asking the client to promise me that I'm going to do that. And I'd be asking the client to uh, go and immediately talk to their treating doctor, treating psychologist, treating psychiatrist about that, or asking their consent for me to telephone the appropriate yeah. person for them. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes when you're actively suicidal like that, you've got to make a call about calling a, a cat team or the police or those sorts of things. But I, I try and engage with the client in that situation to get a feel for how far along the self-harm process they are, and then trying to get the client involved in, no, obviously not hurting themselves, um, but to then to get a feel for consent from the client about what step to take next, either the client themselves or, or for the client. Yeah, good suggestion. Uh, that's great. Any, any other questions or comments? What would be the penalty for that breach of confidentiality? I mean, would you weigh up the risk of the breach of confidentiality as against what do you think your client's well, well, the needs are? Well, the conduct issues, the, the conduct complaints or disciplinary matters fall into the category of either unsatisfactory professional conduct or misconduct. Um, unsatisfactory professional conduct um, uh, uh, allows the commissioner to, um, to not necessarily prosecute that practitioner in, in VCAT. Um, if the evidence reveals uh, misconduct, then I'm obliged to prosecute that practitioner in VCAT. Um, but if either of you got a comment about, about whether that would amount to an unsatisfactory professional conduct? Oh, look, it's, we don't have all the answers. 
Um, but I think every, all conduct can be explained and it depends on the case. I mean, if what are the consequences that flow from that particular disclosure? Is it something that gets found out by the ex-husband and then used against you know, a mother in family, family court proceedings? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. The, the example of the practitioner who, the real estate agent practitioner who got himself caught in a conflict of interest, very early days in his journey down the path he took, uh, he would have been completely forgiven, probably with a reprimand from me, um, or, or, or not even a formal reprimand, possibly what's called a chiding letter, identifying the conduct and making sure he understands he, sh he should avoid getting him that, get himself into that situation again. Um, what he did though is bury himself deeper and deeper and deeper into, a, in, into um, the area of misconduct. So um, most of the activities that we uh, are, um, are, are discussing here relating to the way in which you um, communicate something on behalf of your client in their interests, in a one-off a challenging um, uh, um, uh, case of this nature, the regulator would take a, a, a reasonably benign view about um, a complaint and a breach if it's occurred once, uh, and where there's whether there are lessons to be learned rather than certificates to be taken off people. I'm just interested to know what the federation has said about that that issue. The, the Federation of Community Legal Centres? Uh, the, the view was that um, uh, it, it's protected by confidentiality, right. but, but that um, in order for for us to address that notion of being responsible for the client and also trying mm -hmm. to, to, in the best way possible, um, act in the client's best interest, mm -hmm. it, it is I suppose a mixture of what everyone had said. There's no definite answer. Uh, there was talk about um, in terms of who who are the persons that can be, uh, um, I suppose, uh, uh, contacted, like the treating the treating doctors. But the problem with that is that by itself is, is not sufficient because uh, there are some cases where where the client is able to tell you I'm happy for you to to talk to this person, but yeah. some of them. Uh, do not really want you to do that. And, and we were presented with, um, in terms of, um, someone mentioned about the penalty, we were not really so so uh, concerned with what, what might be the penalty because we thought that, you know, we were trying to kind of like somehow save someone's life. But then someone actually said that um, if someone we did something to intervene and, and that person, instead of actually uh, going away, so to speak, peacefully, end up developing a a serious uh, disability, a lack of disability, and, and therefore we open ourselves to perhaps some tort liability. And, 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 and so it, it kind of like even make the issue much bigger. It's a good, you know, I've got to wind up because it's two o'clock, you've got to get that to, to work, but um, the Legal Professional Liability Committee, who are your insurers, your liability insurers, run a, uh, an advice service that would be um, a very important point, point of call if you don't want to call us um, to get some honest, reliable, trusted advice about what exposures, what risks you're facing, how to manage a situation like that. Um, don't forget to ring LPLC. They've got some good, experienced people who, who, def who defend uh, negligence cases all the time and understand uh, where the where the traps are. I'd better wind up because um, it's still hot. Look, I would like to thank Michael, Angela and Sarah for their very informative presentation. As practitioners we are often faced with uh, ethical dilemmas and your case studies are a good reminder to us all of our greater ethical duties and obligations when making decisions.